James Martinez, Director of Media Operations, ColdFusionNow.org, and Executive Producer of Cold Fusion Radio. Here's a man who takes that very seriously. And we have a lot to learn because not only does he deal with the subject of cold fusion, but I have come to understand through our brief conversations that he also examines the nature of perception and uh, talks about this on his radio show, the, nation, uh, the nature of perception and how we metabolize that and come to understand the things that we do and call it real or not. So it gets into the whole domain of branding, of commercialism, of information and disinformation. It's a really interesting domain that we all really want to pay close attention to. So without further ado, let's bring on James Martinez. Thanks. Thank you, James. Well, <laughs> okay. I want to just go ahead and first thank all the organizers that have put this thing together. I know it's not been easy. Um, I was contacted a long time ago um, about attending this. I was reluctant um, because of my position and what I've done in the last 15 years of my life. Um, however, after conferring with friends and colleagues and taking long periods of time to uh, consider the ramifications of what was going to happen here, I decided to, head, to go ahead and do it. And the reason why is because uh, I think it's time now uh, for this. This word, great word, breakthrough. Um, the reason why I say that is because for most people, the, the word cold fusion um, suggests something that's negative based upon years and years of disinformation that's been put out and a whole field that's basically, in my opinion, been uh, beaten down very badly. And I wanted to uh, reframe the entire thing. Because in my opinion, the people that have done Cold Fusion, Pons and Fleischmann and all the people that have followed them uh, should deserve a huge pat on the back for what they've done and for all the courage that they've put forth. So I'm happy to attend here and I'm also happy that everybody has come from all over the place, um, all over the world. This is the first time this has ever happened and I know it's going to change and grow in the future. So what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of define what media ecology is and how I even got into this in the first place. Um, many, many, many years ago, uh, I worked f for and was recruited um, by government people, actually. Um, and I worked for two federal agents and one naval intelligence officer. And when I was very, very young, like many of you, I had significant spiritual changes uh, that occurred when I was young, that changed the way uh, I looked at the world. I dropped out of college because I discovered that most of what I, that I was being taught there I just thought was a complete, total lie. Um, I was completely, totally disappointed in uh, what they were speaking about in science. I was disappointed about, about what they were talking about in history. And I just completely did not buy any of it. And I wasn't going to participate and pay money at a school where they weren't telling me what the hell's really going on. Um, so I, I dropped out. And I'm glad I did, actually. Because most of the information that's been discussed here by a lot of the scientists, um, I don't understand a lot of it. But intuitively, I know they're right. And I remember looking through all these obscure books and paperwork and so forth a long time ago, and I was like, where are these guys? How come none of this stuff is out? How come I don't see it anywhere? How come there, you have to go far and wide in obscure corners to find these inventors and these technologies, and none of it's available? None of it. And, and how come nobody's talking about it? It's like a bad word. Like, for instance, cold fusion, I can't believe it. I, I, was, uh, I was actually driving in Palm Springs, California when I first heard the announcement on the radio. 
And I was driving, and it's like 100 degrees out there. I got the windows blown down, the music's blaring, and then they break for commercials, and the news comes on. And when I heard the news, and I'm like, they, they had big, this big announcement about Pons and Fleischmann. These two gentlemen have come up and said they've, they've, had, they've got this cold fusion reaction, and it's going to change the entire world of energy. And the first thing I thought of, and I knew, as I said, these guys are either going to be killed or their careers are finished. And none of this is ever going to come out, ever. And that's exactly what happened. They destroyed their careers. Um, and I knew from that moment on, because I've been around a lot of the stuff behind the scenes with government and other people that I've known that are in the military and so forth for a long time. And I, I just was like, it's too bad that every time anybody tries to help out, they're shot down. All these guys that are here, to me, are like total, true, revolutionary, radical heroes because they've been working tirelessly for long periods, most of their life, and they've not received any assistance. I mean, when did Tesla die? Years ago. Years ago. And none of that stuff has come out. None of it. Why not? And I began to like, consider the ramifications of, well, let's figure out why all of this stuff has been suppressed, who's behind it, what's the real story, and so forth. So media ecology is basically the, the study of human perception and the intermesh of technology. And what that means is, and the, the, the best way I've described it on radio is, uh, I always talk about the cell phone, what the cell phone did to communications, what it did to human behavior, what it did to culture, because that's the, the easiest thing for people to understand. And the cell phone, I've talked about on the radio, is hours and hours and hours, and people are kind of sick of it, but it's the, it's the easiest way to explain it. it. It is, most people now, when you walk into a place in California, it's particularly a restaurant, most people are looking down, and they're looking down, and they're not even there with their families. People go out with their families to eat, and they're not even there. They're, they're texting, writing, listening, whatever they're doing, and it's changed the way we interact with each other. And one of the things that media ecology studies is the effect of technology and what it's going to do to culture, perception, and human behavior. And when I first started on radio, I was actually doing something really dangerous, but I was going to do it anyway. Uh, and that was um, sue the banks publicly in front of everybody. And here's what I did. Um, I wor used to work for uh, a gentleman by the name of Walter Boert. He, worked for, he was uh, the author of a book called Operation Mind Control. Uh, it's very famous work. A lot of people all over the world now reference that and use it and say mind control this, mind control that, mind control everything. And I happened to meet him when I was being interviewed in Tucson, Arizona. And it was like an instant brotherhood. I was very, very uh, close to him. It was a very long friendship. I was friends with him until he died. And when I started talking to him, one of the first things that came up was the nature of banking and also cold fusion, believe it or not. It came up right away. Um, but I didn't really know the details, per se, of actually what was going on with cold fusion. I just knew intuitively something had happened, something major had happened, and it needed to come out. Um, so in, that, in the very beginning stages of meeting him, I started to discuss with him uh, my discoveries about banking and money and who controls the banks and who are the people behind them. Not the banks so much, but the, the people who run them and make the decisions about how things are going to be, what gets financed, and so forth. And Walter Bard had a very interesting history, and he kind of, he said to me, he looked at me directly in the eyes, and he said, you know what, you're the anti-banker. Like, you know, uh, the Antichrist, you're the anti-banker. Because I had complete, total disdain and disgust for what they were doing to the world and the decisions that were being made that you guys should be participating in. I think that uh, um, that's going to end now. And I'll tell you uh, some of the things that I did in radio and how it, how it all started. Um, First and foremost, uh, I want to let everybody know that I was set to bring the, this next gentleman, Russell Means, here. 
Uh, he passed away recently. Um, he was one of my close friends. Uh, he's a movie star, civil rights activist, and one of the most courageous people I've ever met. And he was the first person ever, as far as I know, celebrity-wise, to ever stand up and back up Cold Fusion publicly. In fact, that happened recently in the last two or three months. Because as far as I'm concerned, the, the biggest problem with this entire field of all these new inventions and new people is because there is not enough publicity and the way it's presented to people is not a, a, a way that people can digest it in a very good way. I, I heard people talk about this movie Thrive. And everybody knows about that, and I heard from Hollywood people and celebrities and so forth how great this was and blah, 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 blah. And most of you people know about that stuff anyway. But the fact is, it was packaged really well and presented really well in an entertaining format that has high production value. And I would suggest to all the people that are scientists here, if you're going to be putting out and talking about this, you need to have high production value because most people, you're competing against so much media consumption that people do every single day that you're not going to be able to transmit your message across uh, the board very well. So I want to remind that and make a suggestion to everybody about that because it needs to be done. So let me go back to Russell Means here. Um, and this is a big story. And I, it was, I kept it secret for a while because I initially when I started in radio, I didn't plan to go into radio. Uh, I got invited on radio because of, I was suing all the banks for millions and millions of dollars and getting people out of credit card debt, signature loans, taking care of their mortgages, getting their life back. And um, I called to do an interview with uh, Russell Means, and he basically, and that was in the very beginning, he basically embraced everything that I was doing and said, you know, do you want to do a radio show together? And I was like, what? I was like, whoa, that's a big, you know, tall order. I know who he is, and I know what he's done. And I was really flattered that he asked me to do that. And, um, but I didn't, I didn't follow through on that because uh, I, I didn't want to tarnish his image and what he's done. Because I'm all over the place on the radio. I'm totally obnoxious. I, I totally get in people's faces. I'm super controversial. I don't give a damn about um, a criticism per se. And um, he asked me and I you know, got to know him, him and his wife very, very well. And uh, he invited me to his home. He invited me to uh, the sovereign nation of Lakota uh, in South Dakota. And he was very uh, welcoming of everything I've done because he, he thought of me like, wow, you, you're like me. You like dropped the hammer on these people. So uh, he passed away. And one of the things that, that I, I wanted to bring up, and I, I did uh, go public with it recently, but I didn't go into too much detail about it, is after he um, asked me, because he was always interested in cold fusion, and uh, he, he, he asked me, he said, he, he called me out of the blue, and he goes, you know, James, um, can, you, can you get me one of these devices, these cold fusion devices? And I'm like, <laughs> good luck with that. Like, but I can ask, I can ask. I mean, because he just asked me flat out, can you get me a cold fusion device? And I'm like, they're not even out yet. And, I, and if you did have one, it'd be millions and millions of dollars, and I don't think anybody's going to do that for you. I was just real honest with him, because I was interviewing everybody at that point. I knew a lot of scientists in the field and so forth, and I think that that's not, that's not going to happen. But I was wrong. Um, so what I did is uh, I called up uh, Dr. Andrea Rossi. Now, uh, I didn't expect the response that I got from him. But I was really glad that I did get that from him. So I, I emailed him and I was like, mm, I'm not going to call him direct. I'm going to let him, I'm going to email this to him and let him digest this issue and then see what his response was. So I emailed him and he, he surpassed my everything. He, he, he basically said, uh, I'm going to give one of these devices for free when it's available to the American Indian people. And I don't know if a lot of you know what the American Indian people have been through, but uh, it's genocide in the United States. Uh, most people don't even know about it. Um, the entire uh, Lakota Nation, the American Indian people have been basically uh, murdered. Uh, and they're, they're not wanted. They're the minority of the minorities. And um, I read the email from Rossi and I was like, oh my God, I, I can't believe this guy's done this because it's a little premature. But uh, 
that act of kindness, I'll never forget that, because I wasn't sure about uh, Rossi's nature. So I called up Russell Means, and I told him, I said, oh, you want to sit down for this? And I said, listen, uh, I, I, I've got, had done some cor correspondence with Dr. Andrea Rossi, and he said, listen, uh, he's going to give you one of these when it becomes available. A white man is going to give you a cold fusion device for your people. And he would just was completely blown away by that. Uh, he, I, I, I heard his voice on the phone, and I was, I was like, really taken back that he was so happy for that, because he he'd been a big proponent and um, uh, kind of outspoken about. Uh, these new technologies that all of you are talking about and kind of healing the earth. And he was very, very uh, angry at what the United States had done to his people. He's very angry about what was the oil companies were doing. He's very angry about that people couldn't understand and embrace the fact that, you know, we can't keep doing this to planet earth at all. So I, I took that story and I, I, I decided, okay, we need, I need to make this a big story, an international story, this is a big deal. Because Cold Fusion at that point, I mean, and much publicity has got was something on 60 Minutes, which is a big news show in the United States, um, that basically came out and confirmed that it existed. And that kind of restructured the entire field. And uh, I, I talked to some mainstream media people about it, and it, it, this, it's, it's unbelievable. They, they, mainstream media doesn't understand you people at all. They don't even know what to say. They don't, under, they don't know how to package it. They don't, they, they don't even know if it's relevant. And they're afraid of it. Um, I work in Hollywood. I used to be a casting director. I have all sorts of access to media in New York, Los Angeles, uh, news shows, all of that. And I've, I've basically what I decided to do is in radio is to uh, be the PR arm for Cold Fusion and give these guys the respect and credibility that they deserve um, via radio. It's the best way I could do to listen to them, put them on the record, let them say what they need to say, and give them some publicity that they so deserve. So I talked to mainstream media, and I told them, I said, you know who Russell Means is? I said, you know, he's a big movie star, he's been the last of the Mohicans, uh, countless movies, he's been, you know, he testified before Congress. This is a big guy. He's like respected all over the world. Uh, he was supposed to be here. Um, I'm, I'm sad he is here right now. Um, and I decided to s take that story and sell it to the media. And I said, this is going to be great. We need this. We need a good story for Cold Fusion, for somebody to back this up, who's got major power and weight and celebrity and put this thing forward. And I gave it to these guys, and they, they uh, sat on it for months, months. And I'm like, here, here's the phone number of this guy. Here's Russell Means' phone number. You talk to each other, get it on, and then put it out. Sounds easy, right? No, not at all. And that wasn't easy at all. So I got, a, I got a call back from one of these media people, and they said, we don't quite understand the story. I'm like, what? You don't understand? I just told you the story. Do you get it? Do you understand what's happened here at all? I mean, I, I have to like yell at a lot of people uh, to shake them up, interrupt their patterns, because a lot of people have no idea who the hell all these scientists are and how much weight it is and what's going on. I'm so glad this conference is going on and it's being transmitted all over the place. Because a lot of mainstream media, they just don't get it. They understand what, how big Kim Kardashian's ass is and how popular she is in the United States, but they don't know this at all. And this is way more important than any of that. America's morally bankrupt, totally. It's broke. It's falling to pieces. There's no freedom of speech there. There's nothing. It's breaking to pieces. Now, that could be you know, a blessing in disguise because people are starting to wake up now to what's really going on. Um, so back to the story about these guys. So, so I, I, I say, listen... Uh, are you going to put this story out or not? I mean, it's pretty basic. Are you going to do it or not? And they go, well, we don't know, and we got to take it, and then we got to figure out who's going to buy it, and, you know, do we own the story? Do we not own the story? What's the deal with you? And all that other stuff. And I'm like, take it, would you? It's free. Just do it. Sounds easy, huh? No, not, not easy. No, 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 not easy at all. So eventually they just dropped it because I just got pissed with these guys, and they said, you're wasting my time, and I'm going to screw with you.
period, get out, finished. And these people, that, these are the same media company that gave me full media credentials because they found out what I did against the banks, they found out about Russell Means, they found out other things that I'd done in the media that were important to uh, shedding light where light deserves to be on, and that is all you guys, the scientists and the cold fusion people and all of you. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna put it out on the internet, I'm gonna release it that way, and then uh, I, I didn't get a chance to tell Russell that, you know, they didn't get it. He put a laughed at that and like, well, of course, you know, of course, of course they wouldn't get it. Uh, so, but this was, the, this was the first person I could find that was actually going to come here, make a stand, and then go out and contact people in Hollywood and start to rev up the engine here. Because this is the first time, uh, really, that, um, you know, there's actually been any publicity in this field at all. Um, but let me, let me just say this, as far as Russell goes. I will deliver cold fusion to the Lakota Nation, period. That's it. So I spoke to his wife uh, prior to coming here, and uh, that was a pretty heavy conversation, but I said, listen, you know, you're going to be an ambassador of the Lakota Nation, and uh, we're going to have to use you to pull this here. And I said, I told him, I said, this isn't going to be easy. There's going to be engineers that are come there. There's going to be people that are going to come there. And uh, it's, it may take a couple of years to do that, but I, I don't want to let that go. And there were some advantages to delivering it to the Lakota Nation because it's not industrialized. A lot of the scientists that I talk to say, well, it'd be easier to deploy this, uh, deploy this technology in not high industry places like third world countries where they can go in and we, there's not so many laws. It's not, they don't have all this infrastructure they have to deal with and it's a huge pain to deal with and all, so forth, so all, that, all that stuff. So it seemed like a good match to do that. Um, and I, I spoke to his wife about it and I, I know Russell, uh, that was his kind of uh, his last request is really, really important to him. Uh, he was looking at solar, he was looking at wind technology, he was looking at all sorts of things uh, to um, facilitate liberating his people and liberating the rest of the world. He understood how important it was. Uh, you know, the, the, the organizers of this, um, they contacted me a long time ago and I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to take a public stance because I've not been a public person, I've been behind the scenes for a long time uh, working in the media environments and putting stories out that I thought were necessary under the guise of other direction and people and so forth. And here's, here's the background of more about me. I wanted to address Russell up front because uh, uh, I, th I need to pay him homage for all that he's done. So, let me go to this next. Uh, this is the book that uh, kind of changed my life. Uh, it was written by Walter Bowert. It was published by Dell. It was banned by the US government. It was bought out. Uh, Walter Bowert was, it, during his last days um, with me, one of the things that he said uh, to me uh, prior to his death is that, because I asked him, I said, what, what do you think really we need to clean up this huge, monolithic, gigantic mess that we're in? How do we fix this? Because most people have no clue how serious and deep and far the mess is and how policy is made, who's making the policy and how, how that's orchestrated. He did, and when he put that book out, they took him down. It really, really, he regretted writing that book because it changed the entire meme of information surrounding it. And one of the things he said prior to his death is, you know, I, I, uh, I think the two things that we need to do to really change the world, you're going to be surprised with this, is cold fusion. We need to stop beating our children. And I didn't really understand what he meant by that until later on. Uh, and that's an important matter because one of the gentlemen that spoke yesterday, I, I commend him for working with children because the, 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 they're, they're really, the, the, uh, to me, they're, they're, it's more valuable than gold or any money out there because these are the people that are going to be running the world and taking care of it. And uh, we really don't have any education in the United States really that's any good. I think it's completely morally bankrupt like I mentioned before. So... I was doing an, I was doing a, a 
interview in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I've been involved in all sorts of different areas, kind of exposing stuff and bringing stuff to the media environments and then releasing it. I met him in uh, Tucson, Arizona. I, I met him, both of us had very similar backgrounds. Both of us were adopted into families um, and both of us had big interest in kind of liberating the human condition and changing and upgrading it from what it currently is. Um, he was very influential in the 60s. He was started the counterculture in a, a newspaper back east in New York called the East Village Other. He testified before Congress, uh, John, and JFK, while he was alive regarding LSD. He was uh, very famous for putting out news stories. He's kind of the, one of the first whistleblowers out there. And uh, he, we had instant rapport because uh, he knew my knowledge about the banking industry. And he married... Uh, one of the people that put up the banking industry would, by the name of Peggy Mellon Hitchcock. Peggy Mellon, the Mellon Bank Dynasty, are the people that started the Federal Reserve and were in on it from the very beginning. And he started to discuss with me what, what I call the disease of rich craft, rich craft, and what that entails, and who these people are that have all the money, and why they have all the money, and how the decisions are made. Because he was running around in those circles, and he was telling me, well, listen, you've got to understand who these people are. They're extremely disassociated. And so, what do you mean, what do you mean disassociated? I said, disassociated is an, an altered state whereby most people, uh, instead of being associated with their feelings, like when you talk to your wife, or you say, I love you to your wife, you, you're present in the feelings are inside of you. When you're disassociated, you look at it in a picture. You're not in it. You watch it. And there's lots of books about that. One of them is called The Dissociated States of America. Um, and it talks about the, the, the cyclical pattern of uh, child abuse and how, that, how these people that are in these rich, rich, super families that we all hear about, we all know the names, how they can make decisions for everybody else and start wars and, and basically bankroll everything and not be here. They're not even, they're not even, they don't even really know what that is. Most people that have been through trauma and violence and so forth, they're not centered here at all because they can't. It's a, one of the symptoms of trauma. And I, 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 I listened to him real closely with that, about that because when this book came out, it caused big waves. I mean, all over America now, they're using mind control, mind control, mind control, mind control, mind control, mind control all the time. And they really, he regretted writing this book because there was a lot of, he made some mistakes with it. Um, and he, he put out a second book, actually, which I'll show the picture of um, uh, shortly, that kind of fixed a lot of the problems. So when I got to know him, he was talking about cold fusion all the time, and I'm saying, you know, what do we need to do? And if you, if you go on YouTube and look up Walter Boer at Operation Mind Control, you'll hear interviews of him talking about cold fusion and what needed to be done and how kind of dark the system was and the decision makers and people that were deciding the future of the human race and how it was being decided. Because there's a lot of people out there that think you don't matter at all. In fact, they don't even think you have the right to exist. And, you, and, you, and a lot of people need to wake up to that. They're, they're right now, uh, as you well know, a lot of people know, Monsanto, they have no problem poisoning you. None. It's no big deal. That's not a problem. There's no problem shooting, killing, maiming, all that stuff. It happens every single day. And I, I started to examine with him, like, what type of people are doing that? Uh, and how, how do they get to that position? Because most of them, they can send out an order, but if they're in the room actually shooting somebody or killing them or maiming them, they can't do it. So I started to examine many of the, the faculties and associations having to do with bankers. Because I had a big, big problem with abuse of power in the banking field. And this is basically how it started. So I told him that I was suing credit card companies and banks, this was a long time ago, way before the crash. And he found out, well, how are you doing that? And what are you doing? And why are you doing that? And I said, listen, you know, I don't think that it's fair that banks can come in and take over everybody's life and then have the people be responsible for something they don't understand and realize what's happening. So what happened was I put together and was facilitating a company that uh, was taking down credit card debt, uh, mortgages, 
uh, signature loans, everything. And then I started doing it behind the scenes, secretly, quietly, and I put together a company and all the players in the company, and we started to take down the banks publicly. And we went real public with it. I wasn't going to hide from anybody. I didn't care. That's it. So I had about, there was about 15 people in the company. Uh, we beat the banks out of probably somewhere in excess of $800 million. Um, but what I did and found out is the media ecological ramifications of credit cards and how that media extension affects the central nervous system and how it disassociates somebody from understanding and using money. Because most people that I talk to, they're in massive amounts of debt and so forth. They don't even know how much debt they're in. And they're, they're, it's almost cut off. They don't even know. And so what I started doing, I put together this company. We started beating everybody. And lo and behold, when we started beating everybody, the banks came in and shut us down. Because basically, I could, I, I could have taken all the court dockets and reports and everything and put them up all, put them up all on the screen, all the arguments they were using and getting out of you know, this problematic issue with the banks. Um, and these banks also are the same people that are not bankrolling this. I mean, it, it amazes me every day when I hear about this stuff that there's no financing. Still, after all this time, nobody's put any money up for, you, for these scientists, cold fusion or otherwise, even though I'm working on it right now. We'll get to that in a minute. Bit. So, started on the radio, reluctantly. I didn't really want to. Uh, I was asked to go on a station, uh, and I started talking about what I was doing, and of course, everybody loved it, and it became the number one show on the, uh, uh, that network. It was called Republic Broadcasting uh, with John Statmiller. Um, I kept doing that for a long period of time, teaching everybody how to do it and explaining throughout the time I was talking about, because everybody was calling in, well, what is the solution? Is how we gonna, how, what's the ultimate equalizer for the people? And I said, cold fusion is, because it's going to change the structure of money. And, I, and I, I went into some very complex issues about the, what happens when information travels at the speed of light and how that structure changes finance. And I had to go and prove my case uh, for a long period of time. So one of the people that Walter Boward introduced me to was somebody who was active in the intelligence community that was very active in the 70s uh, by the name of Bob Neverett, who I still work with today, who's probably listening right now. Um, he put me in touch with him because at a very young age, I was dealing with military people, like high profile people when I was very young and just calling them directly. One of them, I was talking to Tom Bearden all the time. I didn't understand anything he was talking about, but I knew what he was talking about was major. And I couldn't understand, how come nobody's getting money for what you're doing? I mean, it's pretty major, your discoveries. And that was Tom Bearden. And I was on the uh, Freedom of Thought Foundation with uh, Colonel Thomas Bearden, um, also, uh, Fletcher Prouty. Fletcher Prouty was the, the character in the Oliver Stone movie, uh, Mr. X. He wrote a book called The Secret Team. All of them knew about what the banks were doing. They knew about mind control. They knew all of this stuff, and they were figured out how in the world are we going to change this situation that we're in. So, I continued on radio, and much of the message that I was transmitting, because I was the number one show on that network. I was co-hosting it. And what happened was, I, I brought Bob Neverett on the air, and we started talking about media ecology and what Marshall McLuhan had to say about technology and what it does to perception, what it does to culture, what it does to uh, disruption, and how people handle that particular situation. And then, lo and behold, it didn't fit into, a lot of people didn't want to hear about cold fusion. They, they, didn't, they didn't understand that. So while I was on the air, live, I was fired with my business colleague, Bob Neverett. Uh, and I don't think those archives are still available for public, but uh, my, he, he was threatened live on the air. I was, I, was, I was kind of like, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I, I, wasn't, I didn't agree with a lot of the things he was talking about. You know, violence and guns and gold and, you know, all the things that a lot of the networks are suggesting or prepping everybody to do right now in the United States. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't going to have any part of that. And I needed a way to get out of there. So when he, when he fired me on the air, I'm like, great, good for you. All right, fine, I'm right out of there. So what happened immediately after that is uh, uh, I got a lot of email, and I was getting lots of email from all over the world about, oh, this is great that you're suing the banks, and I can't believe you're doing that. How, how, how are you still alive? And da da da, da. And I, then I got invited to go on another network. And I said, okay, I want to see how this is going to do it on my own. And then when I just started doing it on my own, then it gave me full access to say what I needed to say, get who I wanted to talk to, and that's where I was going to start uplifting 
the entire self-image and self-esteem of all the cold fusion scientists who'd been totally beaten down and were almost like wounded from what happened with Pons and Fleischmann when they're discovered. And I started to investigate myself personally by talking to people off the air and on the air about what's really going on here. So here's how it went. I, 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 I decided what I was going to do is um, slowly integrate cold fusion into some of the media ecology stuff, talking about perception, talking about what technology does to human beings and how it changes how we interact and communicate. So I began by suggestion. Uh, Bob Neverett, he said, okay, this is the guy you need to go talk to. Go talk to Dr. Edmund Storm. I'm like, okay, fine. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll call him up. And he was very open. He was like the nicest guy. I'm like, I talked to him off air and I said, listen, I, I need to, I really want to talk to all the people in Cold Fusion about what's really going on. And I, the history, where it is now, where it's going to go, what do you guys need, all of that. Because I think the world needs to hear this. And I was just total small time uh, in radio. And I did that by design. I didn't want to go into some massive network where I'm going to have to deal with some corporate bullshit that's going to stop me and censor me. I really can't stand that stuff. Uh, in fact, freedom of speech in the United States, it's not free anymore. Uh, I'm like an enemy of the state right now uh, for what I've done. A lot of people in radio are being threatened. Uh, a lot of the families are being threatened because they're bringing up stuff that really they don't want anybody to know about. So I decided I'm going to go on my own. I'm going, to, I'm going to do this myself. So I began interviewing. Edmund Strom was the first interview that I did. Uh, he was incredibly graceful, very helpful. And I thought, this guy's got a, he's, he's got a spiritual vibe to him. He's a scientist. This is the type of guy that I want to talk to. And slowly I began to talk more and more and more people about it. And slowly I started to build up this entire kind of PR arm to protect, promote, and discuss this openly in front of everybody. Because most people just don't know about it. They still don't know. And if you do talk to people, random people, they'll say, I thought that, was, that's, I thought that wasn't true. And that's, a, you know, they're media casualties, those people. They bought it. And they bought it because most people consume in massive amounts of media every single day and lots of it's disinformation. And I, I needed to kind of reframe the entire way in which people look at this whole field. And I decided to do it because I knew that what was going to happen in 2008 with the crash, I, I knew a long time ago that we were going to have that. A lot of people did. And I thought, okay, this is the perfect time to bring this in and start uplifting this whole thing because it's going to crash. We're going to see massive conflict. There's going to be more wars. There's going to be lies. People are going to be stealing. Uh, it's like going to be sanctioned anarchy in the banks. And I know that for certain because I know what's going on in the courts. So Edmund Storm was the force, first person. And he gave me, and I wanted to do interviews that people could understand that didn't, under, you know, didn't have a science background. And I started to promote that. And one of the things that I started to do all as well is when I started in radio, I said, I want the public involved. So I, and I want them to come to me. So I didn't advertise. I didn't promote. I didn't really do anything with the website. I was tiny on purpose. Because I wanted to put everything on the record without anybody interrupting me and stopping what I was doing. And slowly, more and more people started to get involved. From all over the world, I got all, all this email from telling people, thank God you're doing this. I don't understand what you're saying, but you're saying something, and we, I, I want you to explain it. And I started having more guest people on and so forth. So I, I was combining and making the, the broadcast about money and making it about cold fusion, both those two main things. Um, and during that time, I, I signed agreements and I have all sorts of assets all over the place that don't want me to say their name. It's really bizarre to me that there's a lot of people that are bigwigs that don't want their name associated with Cold Fusion. They don't want me to say anything. And I'm like, what? Why do you care? Like, what difference does it make? And then I find out they got families, they've been threatened, uh, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not sure exactly and they're not ready to jump out in the public because a lot of them have been beaten up real bad, uh, and I understand that. So I've agreed to uh, abide by those kind of security oaths and not talk about that at all. Uh, but I'm going to bring up as much as I can here to, to tell you, because I want it on the record, and I think all of you deserve to know. So I, I continued on. I, I, I got some notes here about all the people that I've interviewed. I'm going to go through each of my Edmund Storms with the first. 
Uh, I interviewed uh, Andrea Rossi uh, right when he basically did a breakthrough, uh, kind of did a breakthrough in Europe, and that made big news. And uh, I, I was frankly surprised that he even allowed me to talk to him. Uh, I, I, I think uh, um, based upon what's happened to Pons and Fleischmann, uh, I'm really happy that people have stepped up with as much courage. Because let me just say this, and then somebody else brought it up before. There's a lot of people with uh, a lot of big titles, a lot of big credentials, a lot of little letters behind their name, uh, a lot of education, a lot of achievements. And let me tell you something. Titles do not make men or women. Courage does. Courage does. That's it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this up now while I've had this, because I, I was, as I mentioned before, I, I was kind of reluctant about whether or not I wanted to take a public position with this and speak in public about it at all. Um, but I'm going to, because I'm not gonna tolerate any, of, any bullshit from anybody on any of this stuff at all. And I'll tell you why. Um, Prior to coming here, I was asked to bring some people. I wanted to bring Russell Means. I was going to determine who would be the best cold fusion scientist to bring. Um, and one of the persons, a Washington insider that I know very well, uh, who contacted me, uh, basically said, you know, you need to contact this guy. This is the guy to get. This is the guy to get. And he goes, well, why are you saying that? Well, look, he's got all the credentials. He's totally cold fusion pro. And this is the guy to talk to. And I'm like, okay, all right, fine. So I sent the guy an email. And I expected to get a response like in a week. And I got it like in a day. Uh, and I was like, wow, that was fast. Um, so I call him up. And I say, uh, hi, this is James Martinez. I'm a director of media affairs for coldfusionnow.org. And I'm going to a conference in Holland. And I would, I would wonder if you'd like to attend. Or can I interview you on the radio about cold fusion? Pretty basic, right? No big deal. <laughs> Wrong. And let me tell you this person's credentials. And people get lost in a lot of people's credentials. But, um, and it's ridiculous. Um, this person is responsible for technical oversight and advanced program formulation and emphasis in the areas of atmospheric sciences, structures, materials, acoustics, flight electronics, control software, instruments, aerodynamics, uh, hypersonic air breathing propulsion, computational science, and systems optimized for aeronautics, spacecraft exploration, and space access. During his 43-year career, he has authored 247 publications, major presentations, and 280 invited lectures, seminars, and, and invented five patents. His technical specialties include flow modeling and blah, blah. And this guy could go on and on and on about this, right? And this guy's name is Dennis Bushnell. Dennis Bushnell. Now, here, what I'm about to tell you, I, I, uh, I want to tell you because... Um, I think everybody deserves to know this. This could be, I don't know, I don't think it's a career ender for me. And this person, I'd be happy to sit down with them and if they want to apologize to me, fine. His name is Dennis Bushnell. I called him up and uh, got his number. He, I said, listen, I'd like to invite you to this. Uh, can you come over? Uh, I mean, uh, we'd love to have you. I was very friendly about it. And what happened afterwards, I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. He, he was very arrogant. Uh, he basically threatened my life. He said, you know, we got SEAL teams on the East Coast and we got SEAL teams on the West Coast. And what I'm about to tell you, if you even mention it, you're finished. Basically, that's what he said. And I was, I'm on the phone. I'm like, relax, man. I'm like, take it easy here. Jesus. And like, so then he begins to give me this long like scholarly dissertation on science, which I didn't even understand. I'm not a scientist. I don't want to be a scientist. Uh, and he basically went on this rant about how dangerous cold fusion was and that, that it, you know, there's explosions in the lab and this and that, and da, 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 da. And I'm like, who are you? I thought you were like pro this. It obviously had a problem with me because I was very public about promoting this field. And a lot of people want to be in charge of it themselves. And this is a guy that is at NASA, Langley, NASA. 
And a lot of people, the cold fusion, a lot of scientists, they know who that guy is. So he threatened me directly, and I was like, I, I got so pissed. I went on the radio, and I didn't mention his name, and I didn't know if I was ever going to mention his name. Because it's like, I'm, I'm not going to tolerate any of that, ever, from any of them. And I know all those guys got threatened and whatnot, but this goes to tell you how serious this matter is, cold fusion is, and how there's massive greed around it, control freaks what you can't even imagine, uh, and they want to be in charge. And I think you guys should be in charge, I meaning the public. Everybody needs to be involved with this on the ground level now. So we don't have a situation like where the oil companies are monopolizing everything and controlling everything and they run it all and they own it all and they run it all. I personally think that cold fusion should be everybody's business everybody's business. It shouldn't be a situation where a small group of people control it and then boss everybody around. And I know everybody wants to get rich from it. I know everybody wants to control it. I know everybody wants credit for what they've done. I totally agree with that. They deserve it. But when stuff like this happens, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. And I, 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 was, I was thinking, hmm, you know, if I do that, what's going to happen? I'm like, you know, I, I'm just going to go for the truth. Because the, the, uh, the, the, harder, the heart of a matter is always a matter of the heart. That's it. So I decided I'm going to go forward with that. Maybe I'll meet this guy. Maybe we'll patch things up or whatever. But when stuff like that happens, I, I don't care. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about it. So I wanted to bring that up. I was kind of may having major anxiety fits about whether I should even talk about that at all. But I, I, wanna, I wanted to bring that up because I, I, I don't think that that should ever happen to anybody. I don't think that people that are trying to help out inventors should be harassed, threatened for trying to help out and improve the situation on planet Earth at all. I think that sh they should be protected. I'm, I, these guys like got major courage to me for what they've done. So here's another thing that happened. I, I was going to up in Northern California. I was, I currently, I, I mentioned to somebody yesterday, I am interested in, how long? Okay, I am interested in basically financing this now. I've talked enough off air, on air, here, everywhere. I'm ready to finance this thing. And that's what I'm currently doing right now is financing, getting investors with people I know in Hollywood, other people all over the world and starting to bankroll this. Right now, I would say it's about a year, about a year, maybe less, depending on how much money is available, of the cold fusion coming out. And there's another announcement I'm going to make now I, before we run out of time. There's a lot of groups that are involved with this. I'm involved with a group that currently, and this is the announcement why I came here, uh, currently is going to develop this. They have it. They, I would say they have the Rolls-Royce version of it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody would believe it. It's protected in public incredulity. Uh, and they're going to they're gonna solve a lot of the problems because they're going to give it away for free. Free. That's the way it should be. That's going to happen. That will happen. It's going to happen. Now, one of the things that happened while I, when I came back from the labs in Northern California, I was kind of like, should I be doing this? Am I even involved? This is even worth it. And then something, a big event happened, which kind of changed me. So, okay, you're on the right path. Uh, I got on a plane coming home back to LA. And I, I, never, I never sit in the front of the plane ever. I usually go in the back. And uh, I'm waiting in line and da-da-da-da. And then um, I get to the front seat. And I'm like, okay, I'll sit in the front. And there's this lady sitting in there. And she goes, hey, you want to just take this? Take, take, go ahead, go ahead. All right, okay, all right, fine. She was really friendly. I'm like, okay, good. And I sit down and she goes, how are you? And then fine. I said, what are you doing? I'm like, well, what are you doing? And, and she was really friendly. And I was like, am I being watched? Who are these people? And then I find out, you know, I'm sitting down talking with her. What were you doing in uh, Northern California? Oh, I was, I was visiting the cold fusion labs. Do uh, you know what that is? She goes, oh, yeah. I know exactly what that is. I know exactly what that is. But really. And then she goes, see him? I said, yeah. He produced the movie The Saint about cold fusion. It was like one in a billionth chance that I would meet these people. And they, th this guy is like 80 years old. His, his name is uh, uh, Mace Newfield. He's one of the producers on uh, The Saint. And that's probably the best kind of educational thing still today, actually, where people learn about cold fusion. 
And I sat in front of him and I'm like, and I told him who I was and I said, like, look at this. I said, this is the thing. I was just there. It's real. And it, this old man is like almost having a heart attack in front of me and, and, and his daughter is sitting next to me and is like, can you believe this? Can you believe we're sitting next to this? It's really real. Blah, 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 blah. It was just like going nuts and I'm sitting in the front row and I'm like, because I really wanted an answer from somewhere randomly if, I was, if this is the right path for me. And I'm sitting down with these guys and I said, listen, you need to know this, this is real. And I asked, I asked for his assistance publicly. And of course, no. And I, and I contacted Val Kilmer's people. I contacted uh, Elizabeth Shue's people. I contacted a lot of people. And nobody in Hollywood will stand up with this, for now anyway. They don't, they don't want to get near it. He, he, I, I sent him an email before I was coming here and I said, you know, you're welcome to make a statement and say how that all came to be and what for. But he didn't really want to do it at all. He was really scared of it. A lot of people are scared of this thing. They're like, I don't know why they're so freaked out about it, but they are. And I was sitting down and he told me the whole process of how the movie was made. He said, I'll put you in touch with the screenwriter and I think all of that, all of that information should come out. And I was sitting there like, what are the chances of that? I'm like, I was numb for about two days. Like, wow, what are the odds of that happening? I said, I was supposed to meet them. I'm supposed to be involved. And one of the things that happened is that I, I have a lot of people have made art. Uh, a lot of people from all different walks of life are promoting this, making T-shirts, making art. In fact, a Washington insider that I talk to frequently contacted me. And this is a guy that's a big wig. And he said, listen, I have, uh, I'm also an artist and I have a piece of artwork and I would wonder if you could deliver it to the, you know, one of the biggest museums in the world. It's a, it's a kind of model of what the cold fusion box is to be. And I uh, went, wow, that's a pretty big uh, thing to ask. And I said, are, are you sure that the, the uh, you know, museums in New York and Europe, they're going to want this? And then they, they, there was discussions behind the scene about that, about uh, whether or not they could even take, take a piece of artwork on in the world of cold fusion. And I was like, Wow. It's really, people are really freaked out about this. And it needs, so I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is continue to uh, kind of upgrade and promote this field. When I get back to California, my business partner who's a film producer, Joey House, uh, yeah, I'm meeting with people as immediately when I get back and I'll be probably flying to Northern California. I personally think that uh, Berluin is the company probably is going to put this out first. Um, they're probably leading the, the, the Rolls-Royce version. That's going to show up somewhere soon. And it's going to be deployed. Nobody's, there's going to be na- no announcements. It's just going to start showing up. Uh, and that's probably the best way because I've discussed behind the scenes for a long time how that's going to be done. They don't even give me full disclosure exactly what's going on and how that's being done. Um, and I, and I, I've, I was kind of, mm, do I really want to say that there? And he said, yeah, go ahead and make the announcement. Tell them. Uh, so... I've rambled on a lot. There's a ton of information that I've not covered. Um, I know I've got a minimal amount of time here. So if anybody has any particular questions or anything they want to ask me uh, regarding this, about the terms of promotion, what we need to do. I don't have all the answers. I came here because I wanted to meet with the other people and hear their vantage points, perceptions points, and see what the best course of action is. So if anybody wants to ask me here or behind the scenes, whatever, please feel free to do that. We're going to have you on the panel tonight. Good. So that will be a great time to ask lots of questions. All right. Beautiful, buddy. All right.